introduction to the programme. So for those people that don't know me, and probably this is the first uh, partner forum that you've attended, uh, my name is Zara Niazi. I'm the programme lead for the Integration Cohesion Programme, which we run under Bradford for Everyone. And we have been running since March 2019. So I'm just going to share some slides here just to give a little bit of a backdrop because it's been a while and sometimes I feel that it's worth always just um, going back to the start um, and just kind of going back to the whole kind of how did it all uh, begin. So just as a reminder, um, the Bradford for Everyone program was launched in 2019, but actually we've been talking to government since um, March 2018. Um, and we were one of five that were invited to become um, an integration and cohesion um, city. Um, and really because um, I think one of the many reasons is because we've got three or two dec decades of doing really strong cohesion and integration work. And there's lots of really great pr um, practice and, and good ideas that we can really build on and um, build an evidence base for. This really gives a good opportunity, I guess, to try to uh, evaluate some of our prog programs and activities, because generally there is a lot of strong evidence for some of the work around this area. Um, in 2018, in August, uh, we developed a, a strategy which was in response to the integration strategy green paper that the government wrote at the time. And we developed something quite central to us after lots of conversations with partners and communities about what that would look like. Um, and we really wanted to create a, a quite a wide but holistic programme that really took into account um, collaborative partnership working approach, um, really took into consideration the evidence base and data, but also built on um, that good practice. And we really wanted to provide some space to do things that were quite innovative and different. Um, and so we were really, really pleased to say that our delivery plan is actually being created with lots of conversations with partners. And it continues to be like that through a, a co-creation, co-production and co-design perspective. Um, we were awarded uh, 1.4 million in October 2018. Um, so that's when we started and kicked off in March and 2019. And then um, we've managed to gain some additional funding and uh, finally now um, some uh, additional um, 887,000 just to help us pull over to March uh, 22. Now that is really great for us because it means that we can continue building on that good practice, but also the fact that we are working under really extremely challenging times right now because of COVID-19. Um, and then one of the things that I do want to mention as well is that we also joined um, the Intercultural Cities Programme, which is the Council of Europe's flagship programme, um, in November 2018 and that what what that really gave us was a platform to learn internationally and globally with other um, cities um, and, uh, and countries worldwide um, and so that's been absolutely fundamental in helping us shape and re kind of think um, through why we're doing what we're doing and whether we're really making a difference to people as well. Um, we, um, as a programme, are really focusing on four priority areas but one of the things I do want to say here is our program um, is about everyone, hence the name. And I think that's a really important point to mention, while us, the data highlights that certain communities, certain groups of people perhaps need a little bit more support when it comes to things like integration and cohesion. So our focus really here is um, working with young people, women, um, poorer communities and new arrivals within the district. Um, and, and it's really about the relationship that we can create between people who already have lived here for many, many years and the interaction between um, people who are newly arrived into the, into the district, but also, you know, people who need a little bit more support and a bit of a step up. Um, our programme has been developed by three main things, and I think this was really important just to highlight. So as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, our programmes has been designed by using lots of data, and we have had lots of conversations with communities, and we continue to do so because looking at what is needed out there is really important, and especially with the changing context around um, COVID and Brexit, we need to keep adapting our programme delivery all the time to meet that but also it's built on um, strong theory of change. Um, so basically, why are we doing things the way that we are doing them? Um, how do we know some of the things that we're doing actually work and building on some of that good practice? The second element is really thinking about how we collaborate and work with other people. We really wanna make the point that um, our program and the work around integration cohesion is actually everyone's responsibility. Um, we all have a part to place to make our district a really great place to live, work, 
play um, and be happy in uh, and, and obviously to make sure that our children grow up in a good place as well. Part of it is also about making sure that working in collaboration partnership with all of you in terms of our members, um, our commission partners and our board and, and residents as well. So this is really important that we continue to work in this collaborative way. Um, we also want to make sure that we have an element of system change. So we're thinking already about our legacy. We're thinking about, um, yeah, we are a very short term program, but what can we change and what impact can we make on systems long term? And this is about really influencing other programs or the services about what they're delivering and how they deliver. And the third thing is we really want it to build in some breathing space into the program, which is to make sure that we can continue being innovative. So really looking and exploring at new ideas that we're recognizing that we're testing and learning. And this is really important because it doesn't really matter if things fail. In fact, we really want do, we really do want to have things that do fail because we believe that we will learn far more when things don't work just as much as we learn from things that do. And then the third part is, is about making sure that we're bringing in voices um, from our local communities, our partners through storytelling and actually changing behavior through our campaigns um, and hopefully people just inspiring people. Um, our vision, if people um, haven't seen our strategy yet, which also can be found on our website, which is www.bradfordforeveryone.co.uk. And um, we'll pop that in the chat box in a section, uh, in, a sec in a second, in a minute, where people can have a, a look at the website in a bit more detail. But our vision basically is to make sure that everybody has a chance uh, to feel understood belong, um, feel safe and fully able to participate in the opportunity that the district offers. And our programme really focuses on four priority areas on um, getting on, which is really looking at ESOL and our economic um, sort of um, opportunities and how we can make sure people can get into work and develop skills. The second really priority is around getting along, which kind of says what it, it says on the tin really is just to make sure how we get um, our communities to get along with each other really building um, connection uh, between different communities, whether it's through boundaries or um, different socioeconomic difference, ages in terms of generation, but also race as well and religion. Um, I think most importantly around the getting along strand is that we wanna make sure this is about meaningful contact and sustained contact. So this is not about having one-off events. Um, this is about how we can create long-term friendships and understanding between people. Getting involved, um, again, says it's on the tin there. It's about how we can improve civic participation volunteering. And we'll hear a little bit um, later on from Citizen Coin, which is one of the newer um, innovative projects that we've just launched last year. And we're really excited to tell you a bit more about that. Um, and the last one is really about feeling safe. So this is about how we can tackle prejudices, stereotypes, how we can look at um, reducing rumors, particularly about particular communities. And again, we've got a wonderful video um, that we're, we'll be playing towards the end of this um, webinar um, on I Am Bradford, which was, play, which was created around Islamophobia Month um, to really highlight this particular issue in Bradford. Um, and we'll be playing that in, a, in at the end of that um, webinar. Um, we are looking to engage around 38,000 people, but I'm really proud to say that we've already engaged with around 25,000, um, all kinds of residents across 24 wards. And the fact that we, we have 30 wards, um, 24 wards out of 30 is actually quite a significant reach. Um, and actually, we're also doing that through the delivery of our 50 um, projects. And it's really important for me to just really highlight here that this is about um, our grassroots um, projects as well. So this is our small innovation uh, projects that we funded um, through over the last two years and also our larger projects uh, which are uh, funding to be to, to kind of really run and develop over 18 months. So the significant amount of volume I've done and of course our evaluation in terms of how we monitor um, and evaluate how successful these projects are are actually just um, they are developed quite differently depending on the size of the project and what resources are, are already exist. Um, okay, so what is a partner forum? Um, our partner forum is this is the fifth um, session in the long line of partner forums that we promise to deliver um, while we run um, our program. And it's a really a space for sharing our learning on integration, uh, what is the current research. And again, we'll hear a little bit from Belong and Shella shortly about the um, a national survey that we've been involved with. It's about sharing um, and capturing um, how we're actually looking at evaluating our projects so that you can basically um, help funders 
understand um, how well your projects are running on the difference that they're making. The other, the other element of the partner forum was really try to learn what was happening across the district. There's so many good things in terms of practice, in terms of activities, in terms of projects. And we really want to find out what else that people are doing so that we can help promote what you're doing, but also to share that across uh, uh, nationally through our networks and memberships, but also internationally as well with some of the programs and memberships that we have. Um, we want to make sure that the forum remains a collaborative space. I know this is quite difficult with it being a webinar, but please do again use the chat function um, so that we can continue thinking about ways that we can work in partnership, dealing with issues and problems and concerns, but also um, having a chance to be really innovative as well. We want to use the space um, to think about um, joint bidding opportunities where people can work in collaboration together because we um, absolutely re recognize that uh, not one organization can deliver everything. It's really important that we look at the strengths of each uh, of our organizations and work in collaboration. So we are reaching as many people as possible, but actually we've got a really robust um, project or intervention that we've designed. So using joint bidding opportunities is a great way of doing that. And we, we are doing that through um, some of the contracts that we are looking to commission currently at the moment. But also um, we've got the small grants uh, to the Innovation Fund, which currently at the moment we've got around four that's happening through the area offices. And we can send details more about that if people are interested in how they bid into the Innovation Fund around four through the, in, uh, through the area offices. And the last bit is really just to develop solutions together um, because we think it's really important uh, to keep having the conversation um, and keep learning from each other. I think that's really important to do. Um, the website here, just to end with the slide, is that we have got more information on our website, a little bit more about who we are, what we're doing, what we're working on, some more details about our projects. And you can um, visit that at any point um, on www.bradfordforeveryone.co.uk. Um, so that's a little bit about the programme. I can see that more people have joined us. So welcome to those people that have just um, joined us now. Um, I am going to now move on to the agenda. So um, I'm going to introduce um, our, next, uh, our next speaker now, which is um, um, Shella, who's our um, lead person for the evaluation strategy for Bradford for Everyone. Um, and she's kind of basically working on developing um, an impact evidence base for each of our projects, but also she's been the lead advisor for the national research study um, Beyond Us and Them, uh, which Belong have been working with the University of Kent on. So I also want to introduce this as a double act um, session really with Kaya, who um, uh, works with Belong. And we'll be uh, discussing a little bit more about the, the um, organisation, but actually what the, uh, the national study has been all about, what the early findings have been. And then Shella will kind of pick that up from a, sort of the local perspective. So if I hand over to both of them um, and I'll, I'll let them share their slides. So I think Kaya, if I can hand over to you. Yeah, thanks so much. And thanks for the invite to talk. It's a real pleasure to join you and to, to introduce some of the research that we're doing. So I'm just going to share my presentation with you. Can everybody see that? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do is just talk briefly about Belong, the organisation that I work for. And then I'll talk a bit more about this research project and its key findings to date. So uh, ooh, bear with me. So uh, Belong is a charity and a membership network and our aim is to create a more integrated and less divided society. As an organisation we connect, support and mobilise the many inspiring individuals and organisations organization doing vital cohesion work across the UK. And our mission is to transform policy and practice in this area and we feel that there's never been a greater need for collective and united action on this front. We think that together we can build inclusive and resilient neighbourhoods, workplaces, um, institutions and social spaces where we can all feel a strong sense of belonging. We have members from many, many different organisations, including local authorities, civil society organisations, universities, grassroots bodies and more, and also from different sections, um, so business, education and sport, for example. 
And Belong is involved in a number of research projects that have cohesion and integration outcomes at their core. And our current major research project, and this is the one that Bradford Council is involved in, is funded by the Nuffield Foundation and it examines the impact of COVID-19 on social cohesion across the UK and we call it Beyond Us and Them. It's a project that's conducted in collaboration with Professor Dominic Abrams and the Centre for the Study of group, group Processes at the University of Kent. And it's a longitudinal project, so it's taking place over around a year in total, and it involves various forms of data collection, including large scale surveys, which are disseminated nationally in three regions of the UK in six local areas where there's been considerable investment in social cohesion. So that's the investment areas of Bradford, Blackburn with Darwin, Walsall, Waltham Forest and Peterborough, and then also Calderdale Council, which has prioritised kindness in their um, strategy. We also disseminate the survey via our community partners and a number of volunteering organisations, including Near Neighbours, Joe Cox Foundation and um, Street Games. So, so far we've conducted six waves of the survey and we've captured data from a really, really large number of participants. So we've got this really um, detailed understanding of how people have been experiencing the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, some of you may have com completed the survey already, but it asks you to respond to questions on levels of trust, social connection, intergroup relations, perceptions of risk, levels of optimism, attitudes towards different groups and social engagement. We've also conducted um, around 26 focus groups and over 100 one-to-one -one interviews with participants recruited from the local areas and via our community partners. So we have this really kind of detailed um, qualitative and quantitative data. So before I talk in a bit more detail about the project's findings and then pass over to Shayla, who'll talk about the findings in relation to Bradford specifically, I just want to introduce um, the theoretical framework. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but I just want to give you um, a brief introduction to our conceptualization of cohesion. So social psychologists are really interested in thinking about people's needs and how these needs might be met. On this slide, I've introduced some of the social and psycholo psychological challenges that we face as individuals and communities and societies, and then also how we might overcome these challenges and address our needs. Now, one of our most important needs is for belonging, and the way that this is satisfi satisfied is through connecting with people and establishing meaningful relationships. Another important need we have is the need for meaning. And we meet this need by making sure that things make sense to people and that we have clarity about what's true and what matters in the world. And then a third often neglected need is the need for esteem. And we need to engage in comparison rather than com competition with others to understand if things are going well for us. Um, as, an, as individuals and as a group. And then finally, we need to have control over our environment. And we need a degree of predictability in our environments in order to feel a sense of agency in the world around us. And so if we look at things through this social psychological lens, we can see that once these needs are met, we can more effectively deal with challenges in the environment in which we live. We can also see that COVID-19 has threatened some of these social and psychological needs. So in our research, we're really, really keen to understand whether cohesion strategies can address the social and psychological challenges that we face and whether they can do so in a way that avoids the pitfalls of rivalrous cohesion. Now I'm gonna explain what I mean when I talk about rivalrous cohesion. So when politicians talk about cohesion, they often talk about it in terms of people getting along well with each other. And in reality, cohesion has many, many different forms and can be split into different components. And so on this slide, we can see that on the one side, we have good relations within groups. And on the other side, we have prejudice. And prejudice has a really important role to play in cohesion. And because prejudice is low, it doesn't necessarily mean we're getting on well with people and caring for each other. We might have what we call benign indifference where people are relatively atomized still. They're living in the same places, but they don't necessarily care about each other or work together outside of their in-group. And if that's the case and prejudice is high, then we might have this very negative situation where malign antipathy arises and people don't get along with each other at all. If there are good relations and high levels of prejudice, we get rivalrous cohesion. 
And that's where people are engaged with the community, but feel competitive towards people who are different to them. And our research, model, our research project draws from validated models in social sciences to determine the most relevant indicators of social cohesion. According to most models, social cohesion manifests at two levels, and that's relations between individuals and the state and relations between individuals and fellow citizens. And in our project, we measure relations between individuals and the state by looking at trust in local and national government and by looking at perceptions of COVID-19 restrictions as um, appropriate. And then we measure relations between the individual and their fellow citizens by looking at attitudes towards others, and in particular migrants, trust in others with respect to um, the restrictions like social distancing, and then the density, but also the quality of relations with others during lockdown. So now that I've outlined the theory, I want to move on to talk in a bit more detail about some of the findings and then I'll pass over to Shayla who can talk about the relevance of this for Bradford. Um, and I'm going to think about how cohesion has been operating at local and national levels and I'm using findings here from our wave three and four surveys which were conducted in the summer. Since then we've had surveys go out in um, October I think in December and we'll be collating the findings from all of the surveys. Uh, in January and releasing them at the end of this month. So our first report, which is looking at the findings from the summer, revealed really, really interesting um, findings about cohesion, trust and social activism, and also about the impact of the pandemic on different groups in society and on relations between different groups in society. So the survey data shows that levels of trust in those in power has been seriously impacted by the pandemic with trust in national leaders and politicians going down. So we can see on the graph on this slide that 50% of respondents didn't think um, that the government was taking adequate measures to uh, tackle the pandemic and didn't have a high level of trust in the pandemic. And um, by contrast, levels of trust in local leaders has increased and sometimes drastically. And this is a trend that we captured in the qualitative data as well. And many participants have been praising the work done by their council leaders um, and by the local council. So this is just a quote from one of our focus group participants in um, one of our local authority areas. And they said, you know, leading the work that I've done, the council has played a massive part. They've been forthcoming with support both financial and just on the end of the phone. I think they've really stepped up to the plate and done a fantastic job and should be applauded for it. And that's because, and there's been a, a better relationship with the council than we've ever had before. And that's because it's been a two way working relationship of how to meet the demands of COVID. And I think they've been exceptional to be honest. So we can see that people are feeling united on a local scale, but divided nationally and the levels of trust in local leadership are um, strong. And then our second report showed that key workers and volunteers have had very, very different experiences of the pandemic and that this is connected to the pressures on them and also their opportunities to relate to others. So that's the quality and density of social relations that I talked about earlier. So despite being aware of um, overwhelming public support for them and their work, many key workers reported feeling more detached and more pessimistic than other people, and in particular than people who were volunteering. And they also felt that levels of deprivation were higher in the areas that they were working on. We know that trust and optimism are really important elements for social cohesion. And so our findings suggest that key workers would benefit from um, more social and psychological support to equip them to continue working and supporting their communities. And then our most recent report, and this is the one that Sheila can expand on in a bit more detail, um, compares findings on trust and cohesion um, from comparisons between six local authority areas that, that have invested in cohesion with a control group from other parts of the UK. And the report shows that people in the local authority area, areas that have made that investment in social cohesion um, felt significantly less cynical about national and local politicians and more accepting of government decisions and guidelines. And they also reported better, stronger relations with others and warmer feelings towards migrants. And this is despite the fact that participants in these areas also reported higher levels of concern and higher local infection rates. So this suggests that the investment in social cohesion builds um, stronger bonds between people and more kind of robust and resilient communities. 
And findings from our project are feeding into wider conversations about recovery efforts from the pandemic across the UK. So for example, um, our work has fed into SAGE and also the SAGE subgroup on ethnicity. It's been referenced in Sir Patrick Balance's government office paper on vulnerable communities. Um, it's been included as part of a British Academy report. And we've also been invited to contribute to relevant all party um, parliamentary groups on social integration and to liaise with the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government. And we're in the process at the moment of creating a policy recommendation document that draws heavily on um, examples from the local areas, including um, Bradford. And I just want to finish off by telling you a little bit about some of the really positive outcomes of this research project and also by um, just briefly outlining the next project steps. So while conducting the qualitative research for Beyond Us and Them, we came across so many examples of acts of kindness towards others and specifically um, acts of kindness that reach out across differences. And we've been really, really inspired by these acts. And so we launched our Radical Kindness Project, um, which showcases all of the kind and inspiring and thoughtful and wonderful things that people have done for each other and for their communities throughout the pandemic. And we've heard really, really heartwarming stories of people setting up food delivery services, gardening projects, befriending schemes, and much, much more. And the one that I'd like to leave you with is from um, Bradford, where one of the residents, Kane, who I think is on this call, dressed up as a superhero to bring a bit of joy to residents during the first lockdown. And so we've got an image of him there. We were lucky enough to speak to Kane and um, Shella for one of our uh, Belong webinars. And I wanted to share with you what they had to say about um, the kindness that they've witnessed in Bradford um, before I pass over to Shayla. So Kane said that during the first lockdown, somebody left a sunflower on his doorstep and he didn't know who it was from, but it was a really nice gesture. Spreading radical kindness doesn't have to be anything massive. It can just be checking in on people, especially those who might be lonely. And then Shayla said that people in Bradford have been cooking for the whole street, sharing food, sometimes for the first time, and putting through a card through someone's letterbox or giving someone a call to say, are you OK? These are small acts of kindness that can go a really, really long way. And so just to finish, and before I hand over to Shayla, I'll just tell you about our next project step. So last year, we received funding from the Nuffield Foundation that will allow us to extend the project into next year and conduct two additional waves of the survey and also extend the scope to, uh, to include metropolitan areas. And as I mentioned earlier, we have a report coming out in February that compares the data from all of the waves of the survey so far. And that'll give a really kind of um, detailed snapshot of people's experiences of the pandemic so far. And so what I'll do at the end of um, this presentation is just put a link to our research webpage so that you can go and have a look at that if you're interested in finding more about the project and reading that report. Um, and I'll just pass over now to Shayla. Thank you, Kaya. Um, hi, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen. So, um, yeah, thank you, Kara, and uh, it's, it's a great opportunity for Bradford to actually take part in this uh, timely, well-planned study that is being conducted under the supervision of uh, the experts in the field of social cohesion. And our role uh, within this study, Bradford's role, is uh, we are taking part to make sure um, uh, the researchers, they understand the local context, and we are helping them to reach out to uh, a diverse set of communities so they can um, so they have a diverse uh, they have diverse views of people from different communities and even though the sample might be a, a small sample but it's, it's representative uh, of uh, uh, local people in Bradford so so far four surveys have been conducted starting last year in June um, and two more surveys will be conducted this year one in February and the other one in um, uh, the other one in uh, June, um, there has been uh, some focus groups uh, taken place, some individual uh, interviews as well with people from Bradford um, across different ages, um, background, uh, uh, gender, um, and people with, uh, with different uh, uh, other background um, aspects. So 
Kaya has shared some really interesting findings uh, here at, at a general level, but I'm just going to make it a little bit more interesting and see how Bradford is doing as compared to uh, the other integration areas and the area with the local social uh, cohesion investment. So um, the respondents from Bradford report high level of trust in politicians and trust in others to follow the guidelines, which is more or less similar to the other local authority areas. But data further shows that comparatively people of Bradford has shown higher trust in the local government and less trust in, trust in the central government. In comparison to other local authority areas, Bradfordians showed more positive attitudes towards immigrants. And uh, um, also, uh, Bradford is the second highest area uh, showing strongest personal relationships building uh, with family, friends, neighbors, and locals during lockdown. And compared with the other local authority areas, respondents from Bradford show the highest level of engagement in social activism in terms of volunteering uh, and uh, making uh, donations uh, and signing petitions. So overall, the preliminary findings uh, uh, from the first wave of data collection concludes that while UK is becoming more divided, uh, the data from Bradford shows that people from Bradford are becoming more united uh, have more warmer feelings towards immigrants and are more socially active uh, in, in, in these challenging times in terms of helping other people, taking part in volunteering and making donations. So overall, uh, this research shows that despite showing the concerns regarding the consequences of the pandemic for themselves, for their families, friends, neighbors, and their local areas, the areas with the social cohesion investment uh, programs running pre-COVID have shown a greater sense of social cohesion uh, than the other areas in the country uh, during uh, these difficult times. So this study has provided uh, evidence uh, that validates the cohesion work uh, that has been going on in Bradford uh, uh, for some time um, in terms of bringing communities together so in this slide, I've just put together a very uh, uh, brief, uh, just uh, to show you a glimpse of what some of the impact our integration cohesion work uh, uh, did in, in, in one year uh, pre-COVID, um, where we worked in partnership with, our, uh, with uh, different organizations, different people, um, like Zara has mentioned in, in her introduction. Um, so these organizations across the sector, across different sectors and bringing com different communities together so they can build connections, increase um, aspirations of uh, people of Bradford so they can be more socially active and reaching out and engaging with uh, different uh, communities. Our impact report is on our website, uh, Bradford for Everyone uh, website, which uh, can be read. So are already built stronger connections, partnerships across the sector um, and our community knowledge uh, and our good relationships and our understanding of how uh, communities work and how to reach out to these communities actually made a big difference when we put together our, our rapid COVID response to supporting communities uh, when COVID and lockdown started. So these are some uh, figures here, uh, how uh, uh, the number of volunteers uh, and, um, uh, and how uh, we responded to uh, different needs of different communities. We, you can't quantify all the support which has been uh, uh, given to people, but at the same time, uh, people from different uh, sectors um, come together, people from different communities came together to help out uh, people so we know cohesion and integration will remain crucial in helping communities through these challenging times. And uh, uh, this, is, is, this is a journey. Uh, um, and uh, through this research, we will know um, as the study uh, uh, further develops that how people's attitude, uh, their behavior and their perceptions are changing um, due to uh, this um, situation we are in. Uh, and we will be reporting on those uh, findings as we 
have more uh, findings from the research team. Uh, but at the end, I just want to say that uh, this is this is a great opportunity for Bradford uh, to take part in this study. But at the same time, uh, the findings of uh, this research validate and shows uh, some evidence that the work we have been doing had made an impact in terms of making our communities more resilient to go through this uh, difficult times. So thank you. I'm going to stop sharing my slides. Uh, and if I could pass on to Zara. Thank you, Shala, Kaya. That was a, a, such an interesting presentation. And we're, you know, we're just so pleased that um, what the early findings are currently saying about um, the ones with the areas, especially the ones that have had integration investment, how they're kind of faring against other cities. And I think this is kind of really making a case for government, um, the people that we're currently working with, plus, you know, the council and other other partners about how important it is that we that some of these investments, whether they're small scale projects or quite large ones, can really make a difference when it comes to, um, you know, moments of crisis when there's when there are activities like this. So I think that we're really keen to hear about the end um, sort of findings um, towards uh, sort of January or, be, or beyond that, isn't it? Because it's gone to January to June now. But if we could, yeah, we're really looking forward to share that with the rest of the partners um, about what that final set of findings will be and what they'll tell us. Um, I'm going to uh, now just uh, introduce our next speaker, which is uh, Pete Kemp. Um, he's the Managing Director of Citizen Coin. And I've got to say, I've got a non Pete now for maybe over a year or so. We've worked quite a long time on, on trying to get Citizen Coin up and running. And Pete's been working very closely with Nina Panu, who's one of the project support officers. Um, really, uh, you know, Nina, Nina is very talented, of course, and has uh, runs a lot of different kinds of projects in the programme. But this is one of her other babies um, within the programme. Um, so we're really excited that, you know, we're, we're not the first city, but we're certainly the first city that's doing this quite innovatively um, and put a lot of resource into Citizen Coin to make sure that we kind of launch it. It's got a good platform. And actually, the fact that we don't forget that we have launched this in a very challenging time again, you know, that this is... Um, this is we're under COVID where, you know, um, face-to-face -face interaction is a little bit more harder because of lockdown three. Um, so I'm going to pass off to Pete because um, I think uh, Pete is a great deliverer and he's got a great energy and passion for this because, again, this is his his baby. So he's, uh, so I'm going to pass off to uh, Pete just to tell you a little bit more about Citizen Coin. Where's the concept come from and how you all can get involved because a, this is a great chance to get on board because it's absolutely free to us in Bradford as a user, as an organisation and even as a retailer. So passing over to Pete. All right, thank you. Cheers, Zara. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Feels like a Hollywood stage. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, really pleased to... Um, to be able to present to you this morning um, and obviously really enjoyed the previous presentations too. I think what I'd like to do, if, that, if you could be patient with me, is just show you a little video, which is about um, a volunteer's journey through into, into um, earning, being rewarded by Citizens Coin, uh, participating in an event, um, then being, being uh, rewarded with a Citizens Coin and then redeeming their coin at retailers. And it's about a minute and nine seconds to be precise. So I'll just play this, this video to you first, and uh, if you could just bear with me, and then I'll cut in and I'll explain a bit about the history, about where, where the social coin came from and our development, it, which has been over a, a five-year period. So I'll just play the video first. The video is running through... Oh, sorry, I need to share screen. I do apologise. Let me share screen. OK. Okay, um, so hopefully everyone can see the screen and I'll play the video.
Okay, so that was a, a brief snapshot of the, um, of as I say, of a, a user's journey, but I thought, uh, a volunteer's journey, but I thought maybe we ought to have a bit of history and a bit of context on, on what we see as a, a five-year overnight success. So um, I'll, I'll try not to do death by PowerPoint on this one, but um, I know that's been really naughty. I do apologize, present. Okay, so Citizens Coin Bradford, um, as it states there, is to stimulate and reward your communities. Uh, and obviously we're working in partnership with um, Bradford for Everyone via, um, via Zara's team and particularly closely with, uh, with Nina Punu on this particular project. So a little bit of history. So Citizens Coin, we're a bit of an unusual company really because we've got a really uh, bizarre mix of skills um, for an organization. So we're part private sector. We've got a lot of local authority experience. We've got some voluntary and charities experience. We have um, team members who are marketers. We've got team members who are designers. We've got team members who are, are technologists. My sort of role as CEO is, um, is this, this, this one here, which is the link person. Someone pointed out to me, asked me recently what I do for a living, and it was really hard to describe. I've been involved in, in what I call public engagement technologies now for the last 20 years and have businesses at delivering them. Everything from websites to um, animated video, to live interactive streaming video, to um, um, SMS and MMS um, text communication systems, to augmented reality. Um, and then our, our, this has sort of all culminated in, um, in, in this particular project, which is about using technology to the best of its capacity to, um, to reach as many people as, as possible for the, for, to get the best bang for your buck, really. That's principally the aim. So that's my role within, within the company, is to join the dots and the client liaison and help develop and plan the technology and its delivery. Um, as you see here, the, there's a, the, a whole range of skill sets to do with community-based stuff, to do with, sorry, marketing and sales, an understanding of currencies and social currencies. So we've got quite a, 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 bit, a bit of an odd company, really, with a bit of an odd mix. But those skill sets are very relevant to what we're trying to develop in this particular situation. So we have um, way back in, in the history, about five years ago, I was working with Hull City Council um, as a, a consultant at looking at developing our text-based system for the anti-poverty unit. So they could use technology to communicate with lots of people and advise them on food poverty, um, 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 ideas about how to make your money go further, anything that would help the population. It was a two-way communication device. And, and hand in hand with that was um, an augmented reality campaign whereby people would um, hold up the app we developed and posters would talk to them and give them, give them feedback. One of the reasons for that was there was an understanding that within the whole population, the average reading age was that of a nine-year-old. So that went from people who were um, at, at um, graduate degree level to people who were completely illiterate. And that's fairly common across the UK. That's a fairly common stance. So what we tried to do was develop techniques to deliver to people graphically and uh, via video and via other means of communication, um, which was part of a response to the, to the government's um, um, council cuts, I suppose, when, when the government decided that they were going to um, reduce the spend from local authorities. Hull City Council at the time was looking for a way of maximizing its budget and meeting, meeting as many people out there who needed their help. So the first iteration was Hull Coin. Um, that story goes, we ran a seminar looking at a range of technologies. And we ran, we ran a group of about 40, 50 attendees. And in that we had, um, we had educationalists, we had local authority people, we had some private sector people, we had technologists, and we put a proposition about what sort of technologies could be used. So we were getting away from paper and just standard databases and trying to make the, 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 the VCS, the voluntary and charity sector budget go further from an anti-poverty perspective. So, um, so we applied for some funding. Um, well, uh, sorry, first of all, the, uh, the seminar itself went to, um, it made the papers. And one of the, one of the technologies we were looking at using at the time, because we were looking at developing a social coin, these were very broad sketch ideas, nothing, nothing really solid at all. We were just kind of kicking this around and seeing what kind of response we could get. And 
this the the nature of the of the um of the topic of the conversation at the time leaked out to the press um and we ended up being completely misquoted so a certain national uk newspaper put the headline that was Hull City Council prints dodgy electronic money to give to the poor, which is obviously a million miles away from what we're actually doing, but it's it's typical of some press. That on, on one level was a, was a bit of a disaster story, so it attracted a, a positive story on other levels. So that attracted the attention of, um, of Sky News, who discussed at the time that the officers involved at Hull City Council might be sacked. Um, it went to the Financial Times, The Guardian, um, the paper that, that uh, uh, has an overview on the Nikkei and the Dow, it went to the New York Times, the New York Herald. Um, so we're pretty, we, we got more column inches than the City of Culture for that week that this came out. The effect of that was it blew Hull City Council's comms out the water. And um, and the guys I was working with at Hull City Council were told to stop immediately. What on earth is this thing you're doing? It was all a bit too radical. Um, the council wanted to support it, but didn't feel it was a suitable place from within the council to carry this on. So what they did was they um, they asked if we could um, if we could take it outside the council. So we formed a, a company and applied for our first funding, which was that the, the company was that our first iteration was Hullcoin, because the first funding we had um, that was the title of the of the of the project, and it was a research project to see if we could develop a, a platform which would um, which would stimulate and recognise positive social contribution through the voluntary and charity sector. Um, and we attracted, with this all this well pressed, we attracted some really lead economic thinkers, lead technologists. Um, so we worked with the New Economics Foundation who got in touch with us and flew over from Germany um, to say, look, you guys are really onto something here. What we're, what we're actually looking at is a complementary currency um, uh, that stands outside of your normal fiat currencies, your pound and your, your um, and your euro and your yen, et cetera. So this was seen as a, a very different complementary currency. Um, we also worked with, uh, with Nesta on, on developing the program as well. And a part of um, the team which developed the euro for, for the EU um, under a chap called Bernard Litter, they also got involved with us. So, so we then started to understand the, the broader nature of what we're actually proposing, which is really interesting. So we received the money for, for whole coin and we built a, built a very simple test and learn platform, which we, um, which we engaged with several communities across the, across the, uh, across the city of Hull. So we worked with agencies who, um, who did um, environmental work, um, charities, we worked with sporting groups, we work with um, trainers, people in, in education or people going through apprenticeships. We work through uh, uh, teaching environments, worked with agencies that did environmental cleanups. We worked with, so we worked with lots and lots of those groups um, to see what they would think to, uh, to a system which would reward, uh, which would advertise and promote um, the activities they wanted to, to conduct throughout the city but equal, equally be able to reward the people who joined into that platform. So that was the first kind of sway of the platform. The third part, the, uh, an equally important part of the circle. So you have, you have the local authority or the major charity who, who buys the license for this thing. You then have the voluntary and charities and education and health sector who also can then exercise this thing within their own networks. And then an important, the third part of the triangle, if you like, is retail. So we encouraged, uh, or we went to retail and we said, look, would you be willing to offer discounts against the tokens which are earned via this system? These, at that time they were called whole coins. Would you be interested? And we had a really, really rapid take up. It was very, very successful. We had a 99% take up on retailers who were approached. And we had people from um, retailers who were like little uh, corner shops, cafes, uh, maybe offering 50 pence off a, off a cup of coffee to two pound off a meal. We had hairdressers, we had uh, computer repair places. We had a broadband provider who was willing to offer 99% um, of their broadba broadband installation charge um, for one whole coin, which worked out at 99 pounds. So, so we, 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 we test and learned this thing over a period of years, um, two and a half, nearly three years actually. And we tried it in different sectors and the feedback we got from those those organizations and groups we actually used to to remodel what we had or develop the model 
and we realized that this was no longer just an anti-poverty um, um, mechanism uh, economy it was actually an all-inclusive economy so anyone who has an education journey anyone who volunteers anyone who takes part and gives for some somebody else anyone who's training anyone who has a health journey which the health journey can be rewarded to anybody involved in the environment um, it can link in with families. We worked with schools. So there's a whole range. And we realized that this was a, a, whole, a complete societal um, product, really. An interesting, just an interesting stat to drop in. The National Statistics Department of the UK, I think 2015, said that for um, individuals contributing to voluntary and charitable activities with registered volunteer and charity groups, not necessarily all the other good stuff people do for each other in day-to-day -day life anyway, so the UK economy was worth 26 billion a year. Now that's a massive economy, which at the time had no way of being accurately um, recorded without people going back to spreadsheets and looking across at looking across at how many meetings they'd had and how many people attended up a very cumbersome and irksome experience. So we wanted to develop a system which linked all these, these various agencies together, but also produced a, a system of reporting. So the individual ends up with a social CV. So the person who does all the voluntary contribution has a wallet, when, once they've signed up to the platform, has a wallet, uh, an account, which every time they earn something by doing a piece of social value is, is when it's rewarded, that goes into their account with the name of the agency that's rewarded them with that. So the individual ends up with a social CV, something that, that didn't really exist in, in massive form till, till then. The organizations that do the great stuff, the VCS and uh, the health organizations and the education organizations, they end up with a record of, of, all, the, all, the, um, of all their positive activities, an automatic record. So they're not then having to go back and necessarily create new databases because by their volunteers or their participants being rewarded um, in, in this system, it captures all that data. Which, which is really important. And then from a, a bigger picture, a local authority or a major charity or a major education group or a major health group within their district, they can have an overview of all the great work that's gone on within their region, within their district. And maybe against that, because it's evidenced and evidenced accurately, be able to apply for more funding, see which areas may need a little bit more assistance in various ways so they can help to manage um, and, and develop strategy uh, within those groups. So um, about two years ago, did a presentation at Leeds, um, a social inclusion presentation. And uh, that there were, there were half a dozen local authorities and we met it with Helen Johnston, who was representing one of the representatives from Bradford City Council. And Helen, we had quite a lot of interest from Leeds, who were also in the background ticking away on this. Um, we had interest from Wakefield, but Helen and the Bradford team really pushed this. They were really, really keen and engaged us. So after, after lots of, um, of, of meetings and understandings, and um, we were then commissioned to, to develop the technology. So we used all of our experience from before and we created a new platform that which we call version three. Sorry, the middle one, which I haven't discussed, but I'm running out of time was Eindhoven. We also did a project in Eindhoven, which Eindhoven in the Netherlands, which ran for a year. Um, and, and, and that was a success too. They were happy with their, their results and they're currently finding more funding to go for a, a, a major launch. So we, we, we developed for Bradford um, a mobile phone app um, and a web portal, um, which is called Citizen Coin Bradford. Um, and the, 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 the principal aims behind this was it needs to be fresh and it needs to be funky. It needs to look like it's modern. It needs to look like it's a, a serious player in the game. So, so we, we worked together and designed, designed that. Um, it needs to be um, very strong on data protection, which it is, it, uh, um, it, uh, and, uh, and security, web security. So it complies to uh, Crest certification, which is a, a government standard certification. Uh, we've done lots of user experience and the development of this to make sure that people could quite readily use it. And the aim behind it, our aim was that a user who has the skills to be able to maybe um, set up a Facebook profile, um, upload pictures, make a statement, and like other, other um, activities or other posts, should have the skills to be able to operate this, either from a, 
a volunteer or, or participant's point of view or from an organization, organization's point of view. That was our principal um, aims. Um, so so it, the, the circle that we finally came, came out with um, was about social value, um, which amplifies economic value. And also in that process, isn't a loose out there experience. It actually captures the data within the mechanism, which can be used to develop, um, create sustainability and push and promote um, this particular mechanism. Our aim for this as a, as a company is to, to um, Bradford's first, we have a bunch of others, Hull, Leeds, Wakefield, who are, who are ready to come on board. Um, we've been slightly sideswiped by COVID obviously, but that program is still on. Um, we, have, um, we have one uh, local authority out in Lancashire who we've been in discussion with, um, and that is, um, oops, Blackburn and Darwin, I apologize. And we're also in discussions with Bristol as well. We're also sort of looking at this. Our aim with this is that this runs right across the UK and then into Europe and then the world, nothing, nothing major. But what we have here um, is, is kind of a Venn diagram of, of, of how it works to, to give an overview. Uh, oh, by the way, the Venn diagram was developed in Hull. It was developed at Hull University. I just thought I'd drop that in as a little proud moment. Um, so what, what we're looking at here, the whole, the whole thing is about public engagement. OK, so the way we reach that is by mobile, mobile application. And in the background, the databases that connect everything in our next version of the, of the platform, because this will be a continual development thing, we will use artificial intelligence um, to suggest um, or nudge patterns of behavior for people. So on the red circle here, this is about the citizen, what the citizen gets. So um, the general public through the volunteering or the students or their health journeys, they um, they they within their own wallet can can see a, an evidence of their own social value through their own social CV within local business, local retail that can access discounts across the board um, from a local government or government, public health, education, voluntary, voluntary or charities point of view. Their connection with the public is to, to stimulate and evidence the social value that they're that they're paying the license for and that they're, they're trying to develop. The linked data is absolutely essential to all of this. So further down the line, we see all the various silos coming together. And between, um, between um, local business, re retail and services, and the, local, the, the, the organizations which uh, conduct the license, there's an ev evidence of retail stimulation. From a retailer's point of view, it automatically produces uh, or helps them with their corporate social responsibility reporting, because from within their database, it produces, it produces that too. Um, so moving forward, what we're, look, what we're looking to do, so we're, we're literally, we didn't start this thing, COVID got in our way, we're due to launch early spring uh, last year, we actually didn't really launch until we did a very soft launch early December, and we've had a reasonable amount of take up, we've got over, over 200 participants so far, um, we've got over a dozen uh, delivery partners, we're aiming for a lot more, and we'd love everyone on this call at least to sign up to the platform and if you think your organization could benefit benefit for this because you're promoting some way some form of social good we'd be really happy to, to to do that so what we're about here is we're working with bradford the team at bradford i know they paid for it but this is true anyway have been absolutely fantastic they've been really energetic they've been really thoughtful they've helped us in our planning in the delivery which is a really essential part of, of this whole thing a very active and vibrant uh, team we've been working with and that, that's the that's the truth. You can all go ready in your own time. Our aim is to continuously develop this. So we learn, we test and learn as an organization. We work closely with the, the, the local authorities or the health groups or the charity groups to continually develop this platform. So as, as each new participant comes on, we will have it. Um, so whatever development we do for that particular organization will be built into the development of the whole project. And, and our ambition is, is to scale. Um, is to create, to create, as I say, in the first place, a UK-wide system um, for, for everyone to adopt um, in, in a whole range of contexts. As I said, the VCS um, within health, within um, education, within training. And we see, we see the COVID situation and the, the restriction on business and the restriction on movement and the restriction on the economy that's actually um, uh, uh, developing. 
uh, we actually see this mechanism as a as a bit of a shock absorber, both economically um, and on a on a social um, cohesion level too. So that's uh, that's kind of where we are at the moment. Um, and and that's kind of the end of my presentation. Um, I hope that made sense. Um, and uh, and yeah, I'd like to hand back to um, to Zara, please. Thank you, Pete. That was um, really, really useful um, just to get the kind of concept and the ideas and, and where it all came from, because there's a lot of work that's gone into it and people really just see the end product. Um, but we have, you know, and Pete has done a lot of thinking in how it's going to work, how it looks and how it will be delivered in Bradford. And obviously, I think when we think about long term, it's um, how the back end of it connects on, on a national basis. So that's what makes it really exciting that regardless of where you are, is the connectivity uh, that we're going to be looking at beyond just Bradford, but thinking about, you know, our neighbours um, and other cities that kind of are, are alongside us. I think that's really, really great and really exciting about where it might end up. And of course, we know Pete's really ambitious. Um, of course, he will be. Uh, maybe it will go global one day as well. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, so let's get on to our last and final speakers. Um, so we've got um, Josh, uh, Jules from Magpie, and we've got Nina Panu from um, Braft for Everyone in terms of the programme team. So essentially, um, if I just introduce Nina first, uh, Nina is basically one of our project support officers within the program team and she's been developing um, and working alongside communities, um, residents on our shared values campaign, but she also manages a whole range of other portfolio of projects as well, um, really around community new technology, which is Citizen Coin has been one of them, and around culture as well. Um, and Magpie is one of the agency, well, is the main agency that we've adopted uh, to help us develop a really meaningful marketing uh, campaign around this. Um, you know, we didn't want to just do posters and lots of leaflets out there. We really just wanted to think more carefully about how we really embed what we're doing around shared values. How does it become ingrained into us as part of our everyday living in the district? Um, and we wanted to work with a, an organisation that really got that and actually could develop a campaign that really thinks about how we bring people on with us as partners and, and um, contributors and collaborators as well. So I'm going to pass on to Nina um, and then hopefully Jules and Josh will join in. Thank you. Okay, hello everybody. Um, okay, um, before um, I go into the work that um, we've done in relation to the shared values, um, I wanted to share a personal experience um, with you. I'm hoping that it will bring to light the work that we're doing um, in relation to the shared values. It brings it to life really. So um, this image that you see here is drawn by my 10 year old niece. And I just love how um, she's captured what recently happened to me, which I will share with you in one moment. But I just wanted to say she's given me a very thin waistline I do not look like that by the way um but I do I do I did love the image when she did it when she drew it for me okay so um in lockdown I like lots of people put on a lot of weight so I decided to go on walks so I just thought I'm going to go out and I'm going to get healthy so one day in these local fields near my house I was going for a walk um holding my big brand new phone in my hand and uh, I see these four young people walking towards me and I could just feel feel it in my bones that they were going to get up to something you know when you feel that something's going to happen so as I'm walking past them the only girl in the group pushes the boy against me and uh, I go flying um, uh, get whacked but whacked by this boy and uh, my phone falls on the floor the next minute three out of the four three of the four young people um, run and one stays behind and he and he looks at me and says oh my god I am so sorry it wasn't me I didn't do anything I'm really sorry are you okay I was I was I was a little bit hurt I was obviously um a little bit in shock but I was so so amazed with what he actually did how he stayed behind and I just turned around and the first words that came to my my, my mouth were instead of swearing I turned around and said you know what you are going to do amazing things when you grow up thank you for being so brave and staying behind and um I I really believe that one day you are going to be a hero and he had the biggest smile on his face um he said thank Thank you and then he ran along in the direction where his friends had just ran so anyway I carried on walking looked at my phone luckily it was all okay um, and 20 minutes into my walk I saw the same young people now sitting on the grass in those same fields 
So my heart started to beat and I started to think, do I now go up to them and uh, speak to them or do I just quickly hide and run away? So I, I assessed risk in my head. I thought to myself, you know, for my own safety, one of them was really nice. So I am going to go up to them and I'm going to go and speak to them. I went over and I sat with them for about 20 minutes. I started off by saying what happened there. And straight away, the girl apologized. The boy who pushed in, who, who was pushed into me turned around and said, oh, you know, I'm so sorry. Um, if, if, I, if you had fallen, I would have stayed behind as well. So anyway, um, we spoke for a long time um, and I talked to them about, you know, you know, you every action you take, it has a consequence. You could have got hurt. And we became friends. I see them in the neighborhood now, which is really, really nice. And we wave at each other. So anyway, with this campaign, what are we doing? OK, we're looking for good. OK, we're pointing it out and then then we want more of it to happen. So in a nutshell, that's what we're doing. So this example that I've just shared with you is personal to me. But what I did was I saw the goodness in this young boy I pointed it out then he went back to his friends and he told them that this is this is what she said to me they were probably a little bit jealous but they were also probably like wow inspired by him and now hopefully they will never do this again to anybody else so that's just giving you a bit of a like planting the seed that you know when we're doing this work with the values we all have different roles that we follow whether it's in our workplace whether it's in our communities in our homes in any part of groups that we belong in and what we want to do is we want to use our different roles to bring out the goodness that's happening around us pointing it out and then hopefully more of that will happen okay so that's my real life example so i'll move on to my next slide so the, the, the question is, um, why, why have we gone with shared values? Zara gave a brilliant introduction to our work and she talked about a strategy earlier on in the presentation. So, so when we first started, um, we, we spoke to our stakeholders, uh, local residents, and we asked them, how do we build happier and stronger communities within our, within our city? How do we do that? And it was actually at that point that local people told us that, you know what, it would be really great if we had a set of shared values, a bit like the British values, but something that was unique to us and it belonged to Bradford people. So, you know, and they talked about everything. They talked about inequalities in the workplace, in health. They talked about climate emergency, justice for all, inclusion and social mobility the conversations were really really you know the topics were really varied but this is at that point they felt that maybe if we had shared values what it will do is it will hopefully challenge thinking and make people think about what they could do in the future so anyhow that's where where the idea of the shared values came Josh will you go to the next slide please so the next bit for us was to decide okay now we know that this is what people think that we should have we should test and learn whether this would work um, what should this look like like. And our program is all based on um, working with local people. Our work has always um, been grounded in community voices. It's remained authentic and it's always evolved up. So we worked in partnership with local people. Um, Josh, if you could just go to the next slide, please. OK, so our journey, as you could see um, from this um, um, this slide, you could see that there's been lots of lots of activities that have happened over 12 to 14 months of work has gone into this. We have spoken to over 1400 people through community engagement activities, having focus groups, um, going out and having street stalls, standing out in the rain and being blown by the wind, actually going out there and speaking to people, really having those really quality conversations and asking them what is important to you so if we had shared values what should they look like so all this hard work went into this and um, uh, we then 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 we finally had a set of values Josh you can move to the next slide please OK, so the shared values, if you haven't seen them, uh, we are announcing it again today that this is what they are. Um, you will see that the very basic humanitarian values um, of respecting, caring, sharing and protecting. They're very broad. So, you know, they, they could fit into any kind of situation in any kind of work or any kind of um, experience that you may have in life. But this is this as simple as it gets. This is what our local people said, that these are the kind of values that we want to have. So it's just simple things like looking out for each other, being kind because we care, standing up for things that are right, um, pointing out things when, you know, when they're wrong um, and all of us kind of like growing together. So no one is left behind. So it's all about opportunities and encouraging each 
each other and empowering each other. So the sharing, the sharing value is all about that. Okay, Josh, my final slide, please. Okay, the whole city approach, what does this actually mean? So a whole systems approach is all about all of us coming together. So we, we are aware that organizations are within your own organizations or groups, um, you will already have probably your own values and principles. But what we want to do is we want everybody in whatever role they play in all corners of the district to basically join us in this campaign. Okay, the ultimate vision is that we create a culture based on these shared values. And then everybody from outside looks into Bradford district and sees, and sees that this is what Bradford people are like so and it's bringing it all back to looking out for the that good that's happening pointing it out and then more of it will happen so in a nutshell this is this is a, a really a, a short introduction to how the shared values came and what are we trying to do later on in the presentation josh will actually explain how and what how you could get involved and what you could do but i'm going to now pass you on to jules who will tell you what's next thank you for listening Hello everybody, I'm Jules and I'm from Magpie, Jules Caton, and I have been working on this project with this amazing team um, and looking for good is a, a great thing to do, it's not that difficult, so hopefully what I show you will uh, appear quite simple. Josh, next slide please. <clears throat> um, what we want to do is to look for good, we want to look for great things, but what we also want to do is when we find it, we want to amplify it and we want to share it and um, create more good and to celebrate. So what we're asking you all to do really is to join us in finding and amplifying and celebrating that good. Um, and one way of doing that is to make sure that we uh, show it, uh, showcase it and badge it and collect it together. So visually, it, we feel it's quite important to have a look a feel and a style uh, which just just shows where this good is and highlights it and brings it together so that we can actually amplify it so here you have our very simple bright bold and positive identity uh, or visual style which you'll see and be able to use in all kinds of ways um, and you'll see the heart there which is beating in the middle and is very important And what we're doing is collecting all of things from throughout Bradford from, from the past, from the present, from the future, from everybody and share, showing where people can actually, where people do actually share, protect, care and respect. They're not difficult things to find. We want to show this in a bright bold collage which is actually featuring real people from in and around the team, from in and around Bradford. Um, all kinds of people in all kinds of ways and just capturing this good and sharing it and motivating people. So these are images. We will have a whole host of um, tools and, um, and, and things that you can share, you can use and all of the people that we work with can um, use to motivate and bring people together. You'll see some of the stories and the um, bits of film that we've seen today, which have actually already inspired me. And that's the intention is really to gather together people's thoughts, people's ideas, people's poems, artworks, and all kinds of things, which just really, really um, help us to showcase where people are sharing, protecting, respecting and caring. Next slide, please, Josh. Asking people what the values mean to them and asking them to show us. Um, and we hope to actually really pin this all over in, in and throughout the district in many kinds of ways. We've not quite defined exactly um, how we will do that. And these are some ideas of what we could do to actually um, badge this and get people inspired. 
joining together with other organisations, with cultural organisations, schools, groups, everybody and anybody. Um, and not knocking um, any kind of um, identity or brand or, or anything out of the way, but really joining forces and, and, and helping people to look at how throughout the Bradford district, people are already protecting, sharing, respecting and caring. We want to invite people to join us and we want to get people's thoughts and ideas. We want to um, bring people, um, as many people as possible on board. And there's, there's just some of the, the tools and materials uh, shown here that we might use to do that. Clearly, um, you know, we want to be um, using digital tools, digital marketing and tools which people can actually use themselves and share and add to. Um, and Josh is going to talk about how you can get involved and what you can do, but um, what we want to do is to make this as easy as possible, as simple as possible, and as exciting and uh, enjoyable as possible. So we have a set of tools and materials that people can uh, use to come on board with. And as I say, we're not quite sure where we're going to put this yet, but we would really like to do some very big, bold um, badging of this whole campaign and to really get people excited, but very much using um, the words, the pictures and anything that people find to describe what the values mean to them. And that means uh, showcasing and bringing on board uh, real people. So, so the, the actual images will all be of people from throughout the Bradford district. And I'm gonna hand over to Josh now, thank you. Hi there, thank you Jules, uh, just finding my mute button. Um, well hello everyone, uh, I'm Josh, I'm a, I'm a campaign manager, I'm Magpie and I'm actually working with Nina and the team at Bradford for Everyone to help deliver this exciting project. Um, so today uh, I want to tell you about what's next for the Bradford District Shared Values campaign and what you can do to, to support it. Okay, well, first, I just want to show you this graphic, and it's a graphic of a behaviour change model, which is based in academic theory. Uh, as we all know, uh, changing our behaviour doesn't happen overnight. Sometimes we wish it did, but uh, it does happen, but change does gradually happen if one person experiences uh, each part of this uh, process. And uh, these sort of stages, uh, the theoretically, are pre-contemplation, uh, contemplating, so contemplating the change, preparation, uh, action, actually doing the change, maintaining that, maintenance, and then continuing to change. Now, what we've done um, at Magpie is we've overlaid our sort of campaign stages over these um, stages of behaviour change uh, to sort of create um, a, camp a full campaign. So these stages are co creation, educate raise awareness, promoting positive experiences, uh, reminding courage and evaluate. Um, so from a very top line, when we've thought about our actions throughout this campaign and how we develop it, this is the model that we follow. So what's next? All very exciting. So in January and February, we're really focusing on the education and raising awareness stages of the campaign uh, and our aim here uh, twofold really. First to gain as much district-wide awareness as possible of the campaign and that starts here today. We're giving you our sort of the first exclusive look of um, the Bradford for Everyone Shared Values campaign uh, style uh, and we wanted to do that at this partner forum because you know you are you are Bradford for everyone's closest partners and friends. So I was really happy to give you guys a first look of this today. And uh, secondly, we wanted to convert this awareness throughout the district into actual supporter base who will join the campaign and promote and celebrate these shared values within their own organisations, within their own groups, or even just within their own community but we want people to do that in their own unique way which is relevant to them and the people that they share these values with 
Um, so actions, we will achieve this by launching the campaign and sharing the key messages really to as many people as will, list, as will listen to us. Um, and obviously that starts today, um, but we'll also be looking to engage key influencers at all the big institutions in Bradford, um, sharing it with the local press, and again, really tell as many people as we can about it. Um, everyone who will be joining this campaign um, will be sent a campaign supporters toolkit. So if you think of maybe the toolkits that get sent by Comic Relief or by um, uh, Macmillan Cancer uh, coffee mornings, yeah, they're great sort of packs, but this would be a digital pack that would be sent over. And it's really there to give you the inspiration and the motivation to celebrate and share these shared values in, again, in your own unique way. That's the important part about this. So how does that look moving forward beyond January and February? Well, by this point, we really want to be um, getting to the stage where we're promoting these positive experiences which are happening uh, around this campaign, so people doing everything. Um, uh, and our, our real aim here is to inspire campaign participation with as many groups and organisations as possible, and we really want it to be a completely varied group of different ages, religions, um, throughout the district. Um, we then really want to find these great things which are happening uh, around the shared values. We want to find them, we want to amplify them, and we want to celebrate them um, as much as possible. Um, a key action of this stage is to actually track how many individuals interact with this campaign and we'll be doing that by having an online pledge counter so whether it's a class of students who do something um, around uh, Bradford district shared values we want all them to be counted and we want to build this picture of how many people are pledging to these shared values and that will enable us to really see this campaign growing in front of our eyes. Um, the final important point is that we are, will, will be setting up a Shared Values in Action Week. So this is a dedicated week where people who are taking part in the campaign can all run their activities or their celebrations in one week, concentrate, concentrate, concentrating it down to giving it the biggest sort of impact and splash across the district as possible. And again, we will be sort of capturing and sharing these, these sort of celebrations um, and hopefully this would be something that would be an annual, an, an annual showcase of all the great things and values that Bradford holds to themselves. So we'd love you to become the first people to join the campaign. Uh, we welcome you signing up if you are from an organisation or representing an organisation or community group. But we also want you as individuals, and if you think you can take on board this campaign and share it within your sort of close community, family and friends. Um, so yeah, so what I'll do is I'm going to put a link in the chat box um, to all attendees. Um, so if you want to click on that link, it's just a short form to fill out. And once you've uh, signed up, you'll then be the first people to receive um, email updates and digital toolkits via email. So you can take part in the campaign. Uh, so I'll just do that now and I'm sure that there'll be this link will be shared after the meeting um, by Bradford for everyone. Okay, well, um, thank you so for everyone who's going to be joining our workshop um, after this session, we really want to sort of now use what you've listened to today from the Shared Values Project and we want to hear from you. So we hope you join us uh, for the uh, breakout uh, workshop. Right, I'm going to hand over Back to Zara, thank you. Thanks Josh, Jules, Nina, excellent presentation. Um, some really good comments uh, in the chat box just about the length of time and the level of um, co-creation, co-collaboration um, that we've done around this piece of work. So I think that's great that that's really coming across that this isn't something that we've just cooked up um, in an office somewhere, but actually, you know, it's taken a long time to come up with these. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion and involvement from people, organisations. Um, so we're really hoping that this will be really a good start 
um, to lead on to a discussion um, outside of this webinar link. Um, if I can get Kane to put in the Zoom link for the workshop, what we'll be asking for you to do shortly is to move off from this webinar to the workshop link where you'll get a chance to speak to Jules and um, Josh and Nina in a little bit more detail about what, how you can practically use these tools, uh, what you might need to really help you get involved, uh, to, to as, as Josh says, to get motivated. Uh, really on these as well. So what, what would it take for you guys to take some of these things on board? Um, so um, while we're just doing that and, and just giving a chance, I'm going to give people an opportunity to still ask questions if you prefer on the chat box. Um, the workshop um, will start as soon as the webinar ends, just because we're running a little bit over time. So as soon as I close the webinar, we'll be moving straight onto the Zoom link, if you can, please, just to make it quick. Um, I won't play the last video just simply because we are running over time, but I'm happy to send that across through the Eventbrite, everybody that registered originally on the webinar, so you can watch the video in your own time as well. Um, so this was the video for I Am Bradford, which is which was um, launched over Islamophobia Month. Thank you to all of our panellists and our guests that um, have just been uh, presenting today just for us. So Kaya and Pete, and of course, Jules and Josh, and some of our team members, Shala and Nina. Shala unfortunately had to, had to leave. Um, but thank you to, for all of the presentations. We are available on hello at bradfordforeveryone.co.uk uh, if people want to ask us questions. Um, other than that, thank you so much. And we hopefully will see you in a second in the workshop area. Take care everyone, thank you so much and see you shortly. Bye.